sorry. I mean, uh, you know me about these things. I want to make sure that we quote this correctly. Uh, Rumi did not mention that God knew this. No, but so they, all, they, all the story, the way it was uh, basically presented is that, yes, this was something that uh, needed to happen when it had to happen. And uh, because of this, you know, um, you know, uh, it's just that Israel at that time was just totally baffled as to, hey, why is this guy here? Whereas I'm supposed to take his life in two hours in India. Yeah, but and that intuitively means that God knew about it. Hold on. That, so, okay, so, sure. so, 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 I understand that. I just want to make sure that we, I want to stick to the text. Okay. And the reason I want to stick to the text is because I'm sure that at the, po at the moment and the point that Rumi feels that he would exert that, um, uh, you know, part of, you know, God's lesson or, or, or God's, uh, you know, attribute, he would. At the moment, he hasn't. All he is basically trying to establish is that there is a, our destiny is something that we would not necessarily, we cannot argue about or argue mm -hmm. against. Our destiny is, is where it is. And we don't know it, by, by the way. We don't know it. As a matter of fact, we do what we can in order to, um, I don't know how to say it, but that yeah. guy, one of the things that he was trying to do, he was trying to actually change his destiny, if I'm right. not mistaken, right? That's what correct. He was hoping to, for, 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 for this to happen was that, yeah, you know, I'm going to go and uh, I will um, hopefully, you know, get to, um, uh, let me see if I can, okay, yeah. So he was, he was hoping that he would uh, just get to escape death. And in this case, of course he couldn't. And there was that, that, that ship definitely did not sail well with him because he then, um, um, yeah, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't happen for him. So, so I think what we are, we're taking away from what we, we read last week is that, uh, um, what, 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 what needs to happen if it has to happen, if it has to happen, we can never escape it. Mm -hmm. we, there's no way. Another example that uh, Rumi brought for us is the example of Pharaoh and uh, Moses. The fact that Pharaoh was so much into, um, you know, not allowing Moses to be born. However, uh, by fate and destiny, Moses was conceived underneath his own uh, throne. So it's, uh, this is again, another thing that Rumi is telling us that, you know, yes, these are, uh, these are elements that uh, we, we just have to be conscious of as we see them and uh, yeah, be okay with it. Uh, he, and, and, and another thing that, by the way, he's trying to tell us, he wants us to be okay with a lot of things. And this is important for us to, to, to remember. Um, if he can't be okay with stuff, um, it's uh, it, it's going to put us in a bad in a bad position. Let's put it this way: if we can't be okay with things, we're gonna uh, we're gonna try to uh, let's say um, we're gonna try to escape. Uh, certain things and that puts us in a, uh, a resistant position uh, with respect to life and our destiny and what uh, you know has been set forth for us to experience and Rumi says uh, is trying to tell us that as we 
as we fight this, this is not going to go well with us because, you know, fighting it is just going to make everything harder for us. We have to be okay with it. We have to be, you know, just um, all, um, um, you know, um, all content and we have to be in an accepting position and uh, acceptance and, uh, you know, uh, having no resistance towards it is something that I think, you know, he's trying to kind of get us to, um, to see and, um, and perhaps experience. Okay. Uh, anything else from last week that, uh, you know, from, from this story, I know we, we read a lot of stories and we will be reading a lot of stories actually uh, going forward. Uh, today a, a little bit until we actually get to um, you know uh, the, um, the the meat of the uh, of the matter. Um, it, I think we left around somewhere right about here, right? The lion prey uh, prefer trust in God over exerting oneself. Is that where we left, or no? We're all uh, the way nine ninety five. Nine ninety. Yeah, exactly. Nine ninety. Holy cow. Wow, we read so much. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Actually, we are right at the, the establishment. Okay. Yeah, right, the establishment. right. You passed it. Gotcha. There you go, right there. Okay. All right. I got it. So, uh, okay. So, I see where, where we are at. Okay. Um, another uh, 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 part that uh, uh, just a couple of lines I want to kind of go go through here, if you don't mind. Um, a couple of lines that you know we we experienced together uh, last time. So it says uh, one of the things that Rumi was trying to tell us is that so dig a tunnel to escape your 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 cell, don't block it up, or you'll be stuck in hell this world's a prison you're locked up inside to free yourself dig all the way outside and uh, then another thing that you know he's been trying to tell us is that you better empty yourself of yourself of the self that is you know basically um, tying you to all the needs and wants of this uh, this world so he uses the example of water and a boat. And he says, water that's poured inside will sink the boat while water underneath keeps it afloat. So basically he's like, it's a good idea to keep this, um, you know, um, these asks and wants outside of your, your own self and free yourself so that you can, you can be able to float through this life. And the best way to actually go through this life, uh, Rumi believes that, you know, it's by floating. I mean, he literally wants us to experience floating, which is, uh, again, um, it's, it's, it's an amazing, uh, you know, a concept that, you know, we, 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 would talk, we talk about it. Uh, and again, in, in the, in the, um, um, in the, um, uh, in the Western uh, new philosophy, they also have talked about this and they are, you know, basically, uh, you know, they have, uh, you know, Western th new thinkers have totally brought this in. And, and this has been something that, uh, uh, you know, folks are, uh, tr you know, have, are trying to teach themselves to kind of navigate through things. Even if you go back and, and read about Bruce Lee, who was the martial arts expert? And um, some of you guys may remember him. Uh, you know, of course, one of the things that uh, made him unique about his style of martial art, it's amazing. I actually heard this when I was at a uh, process efficiency seminar. And the guy who was presenting, he gave this quote that the best process is the process that actually brings the least path of resistance. And um, he then, you know, went on to say that uh, Bruce Lee, because of the style of martial arts that he 
was practicing and teaching, which in his opinion, he, you could not, he, he would not resist what was coming towards him. And rather he would just try to allow it to pass through him, not of course hitting him, but passing through him and then, you know, exert the punch or the kick that he needed to do and so forth, which was pretty effective apparently. So Bruce Lee said, uh, be like water. Exactly. He, he, that's the, that's the code to be like water. And, and again, it's a, you know, water as it actually flows through a river and it goes around the stones and all the obstacles and all that stuff. Anyways. And then at the end, uh, you know, I think we read that, yeah, like pain and cure exertion is being exer exertions being true. Denial of this is more exertion too. So, um, you know, uh, the fact that um, he says that, you know, it, it, all of these things are truth. There's truth behind them. That means that God has given all of these abilities to us. It, these are all given to us. And the fact that we are actually choosing one over the other is also, it is, uh, you know, the, you know, um, the, the practice of exertion. And again, the, the word exertion is something that, you know, of course, you know, it makes sense from a literal translation, but, you know, at, at the end, uh, uh, it's, uh, at the end, it's, it's a, I just want you guys to remember that there's the opposites, right? So it's exertion versus trust and trust in this case is trusting in God rather than actually fight or, or, or working for something. And then similar to it on that parallel is the exercise of choice, having choice and free will versus believing in fate. Okay. I just want you guys to be distinctly clear about how these things kind of stack on top of each other because I don't want to kind of mix the two together, although they are both on the same side. So the guy who exerts is, uh, you know, somebody who um, mainly believes in free will. That's why he's trying to actually do anything and everything in his power to do what he needs to do. And the guy who believes in, you know, um, um, fate and uh, trust uh, in, in God is the one who would most probably uh, choose uh, fate over free will. Now, this does not exclude the guy who actually does believe in free will of not trusting God, which Rumi is that, that guy. He actually believes that, yes, I do have free will, I do want to exert and, and try for things that I, I'm, I'm, you know, challenges that come to my life and so forth. However, at the same time, I actually fully uh, trust in God that the right thing is going to also happen for me, which is something that he's also trying to teach us. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So... After that lengthy conversation, let's go into um, our story. So now the establishment of the superiority of exertion over trust, right? Yeah, that's where we are. So uh, So Rumi says, so many proofs the lion would relate, the fatality, uh, the fatalists grew tired of this debate. So they, they basically went back and forth on this. The fox, the deer, the hare, and the, uh, the jackal too stopped answering back, abandoning their view. So finally they, Rumi, and, and by the way, Rumi is trying to tell us that in real life, this is actually what happens. The two groups are very much, when they actually start talking about this, the ones who believe in total uh, uh, trust and the one who actually believe in total free, free will versus destiny, these guys finally would get tired because there's examples on both of it. 
So they just really would get tired at the end. So this is not really these animals getting tired. This is actually us. We eventually will just get tired of it. And he's just trying to tell us, hey, you know what? It's better to live your life. With, with him, they agreed a deal where he would not lose out. They gave a guarantee. Each day a beast would come straight to his den without a need for him to hunt again. Whoever drew the shortest of the straws would race like a cheetah to his jaws. But so, when the so, hurt, so these four animals among themselves, they say, let's not fight it. Among us, we'll draw a straw. Whomever comes up with, we go become that that day's lion's feast. Yes, and, and by and the way, he doesn't uh, have to come and hunt and kill the rest of us. Is that the story? That's exactly the story. Okay. And by the way, it, it, the four animals that he's actually just mentioning, it's just purely because of poetry. Right. I'm sure there were others. I, I'm sure there was a sheep in there too, somehow. And uh, but yeah, it's basically these are the four that he actually says. So yeah, they they just said you know we're gonna choose who's gonna come to you and we'll honor our um, our promise. Now, so uh, now that's uh, but and then you know the last line says but when the hare's turn came, and the hare's is basically a rabbit. Uh, it's interesting. I had to look this word up. It's the red-nosed uh, animal um, somehow, but it's the rabbit. Okay. So, uh, but when hers, uh, but when the hers turn came, he screamed a lot. How long must tyrants take all that we've got? <laughs> so now rabbit is like, no way. I'm not going. I'm not letting him eat me. So the un other animals blamed the hare for his delay in going to the lion. They told him many times we've sacrificed our lives to keep our pledge and that's sufficed. You stubborn hare, don't shame us anymore. Now hurry up before he starts to roar. And the hare of course answers back. The hare said, friends, won't you give me a respite? My scheme will, will save you from your sorry plight. Life then will be secure for all of you. The same applies for all your children too. Each prophet called on his community in the same way to seek security. A route beyond each could identify and narrow as the pupil of an eye. Now, the reason uh, the word pupil is used here is because in Farsi, the word pupil is written the same way as the word people is written. Okay. So he's literally actually using this word uh, from a similarity perspective to actually talk about how narrow vision people are. And that's why he's using the word pupil. And uh, of course, people and pupil also somehow, I, I, I heard somewhere that there are somehow related, but I don't know whether that's the case or not. But in this case, he's really talking about masses and how narrowly sometimes they think, uh, uh, you know, about, uh, about, just subjects and, 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 and uh, sometimes they just um, give themselves up uh, for no reason. Well, Sam, so, yeah. I have another uh, uh, understanding of the use of this pupil. Yes. Which, uh, so, is, uh, so in Farsi is Mardomak. Yes. Uh, uh, which is uh, little people, not, not, not just any people. Exactly. And, and the, the reason that this pupil is coming up in the conversation from here is to tell him, don't look at me that I'm little. I, I can do a lot. Because, right. because uh, the, the pupil essentially, as little as it is, it can fit mountains in it. It can fit the whole 
seen as big as you can imagine in the little thing that you have in your eyes. Absolutely. So this is the line that actually talks about that. You're right. So he says, their people fought them like the pupil, small. So basically, yeah, people... So basically, Rumi is trying to tell us that just in general, people and masses believe what they see. And if they see something that's small, they think he's small, you know, or, or, or his domain is small. But who could boost um, their guarantees? Uh, I'm sorry, who could boost their greatness? Not at all. So if, if people have to, ha and, and in, in this case, uh, uh, the boosting is referring to people who see little. It's like, sometimes you can, whatever you do, people are not letting go of what they see and how they interpret that. And I think the, this line applies to nowadays. I think it literally applies to us. Nowadays, you know, people see, you know, things. And as soon as they see it, they believe it. And if you try to tell them anything different, they're like, no, this is what I saw. And that's all there is to it. And there is no fighting with that. There is no, there's no, you, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in so many words, Rumi is like, don't waste your time with it. Don't try to change them. We want to change us. In a sense, change yourself first. Worry about everyone else second, just because of the fact that unless you change what's within you, things uh, you know, outside of you really doesn't matter. So the other animals object, of course, uh, to the words of the hare. Um, don't be a donkey's hare. Now listen well. Act like the hare you are so all can tell. You're bragging to your betters. Don't ignore the fact we might have thought of this before. Either you're arrogant or it's your fate. I'm sorry, or it's our fate. How can your speech fit someone in your state? They're like, you can't even talk about this right now with us. Don't even put us in this position. You got to go. That's it. All right. Uh, now, of course, uh, you know, he, he answers back. Uh, and he says... Uh, he said, my friend, by God, I've been inspired. A, a weak, weakling, weaklings learned strong views. That's what's transpired. So he kind of uses their own belief against them in this case that, listen, if you guys are saying that God is the one who is has put a lot of things together. So therefore, you know, you believe in your own faith. I'm telling you that he also can give something that is so small, a lot of power. And that's exactly what was happening here. God taught the bee a skill. That's something more than what he taught the lion and the boar. So He's now going into a little bit deeper into this argument. And he says that, yeah, there was a, there, there is a lesson that God taught a bee in order to. And, and this is basically um, referring to uh, the Surah uh, An-Nahl. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's 68. Yeah. And your rab or uh, God inspired to the bee, build your hives in mountains and among the tree and in what they built. So, and then, you know, basically this is the story of, um, you know, how we do believe that bees uh, get, uh, um, 
vahy or you know that uh you know divine melody from god directly and of course the the um ayahs in 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 the quran um do support that what's in yes sir um these uh, bees are just are an amazing creatures that god created that uh, really anytime anybody has any doubt about the almighty this is a good example because when 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 they're when uh, in the uh, bee farms there are millions of these bees that they go to get uh, fruit and then when they come back they all go to their own instead of going to somebody else's and also and and, and the uh, the uh, what what is that thing that the uh, uh, the honey is made in the hexagon shape? What is it called? Oh, the uh, in the cones? Uh, no. The cone. The, yeah. the, the, the honeycomb. Honeycomb. Yeah. So if that honeycomb was built in any other shape than hexagon, it wouldn't last. If it was made in tri uh, rectangular shapes, the thing will collapse. And it's made in hexagon. Who taught them geometry? Exactly. And, and that, very, that's the very, amazing. And a very, very um, accurate job. Accurate, like it, I, yeah. It's, it's yeah. extremely accurate what they do. It's, yeah, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it would definitely put you at awe when, when you actually think through it as far as, you know, this is just one example of. Uh, just one example. Yeah. God's just a beat. Creation, of course. Yeah. Thank you. And, so and the by bee, the way, uh, the, this hair used the bee again, or uh, the uh, Molavi used this just to show that is the little is little, but it does a lot. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's going to use another example pretty quickly, also, which you know he's going to talk about uh, a fly. So you know, he, again, he does on both sides. So so so. <laughs> He's, yeah, just hold on, hold on to this, um, and, and we'll read that. So the bee can make a moist, sweet honeycomb. God's opened up to it his wisdom's home. Like when he taught this silkworm how to spin, an earthworm uh, worm wouldn't know where to begin. And Adam learned such truth from God that fire blazed up to heavens as massive prior, but but the good name of angels was wiped out by that blind one who God's own words would doubt. Now this is uh, basically he's referring to again he uses the examples of the bee and also he uses the example of the silkworm. So both of these are examples of how very small, minute creatures are able to actually do big and great stuff by God's will. And then he's now going back and referring to uh, this uh, whole thing that, um, sorry. Um, so he's now referring to uh, the, um, um, the creation itself. And he's now talking about what happened with, and, and, and again, you know, he's just using all sorts of sizes and logics and examples just because he wants us to explore and expand our mind because he, he's trying to tell us how limited our mind is and how we can actually fall into these traps if we start looking into generalization and generalizing certain words and ideas in uh, or, or beliefs in our minds and uh, he's referring to the fact that you know uh, all the angels were uh, you know were taught by uh, you know Adam when Adam was uh, and I think uh, we I believe we we read this um, at some point I'm gonna um, bring the ayah here um, uh, No, we don't. We didn't. So it's uh, Surah Baqarah, um, verses 31, I think it's through 34. And uh, here it is. <laughs> so, uh, 
So he says, and he taught Adam the names of all things, then showed them to the angels and said, tell me if the names of these things, if you are truthful. They said, glorified you are. We have no knowledge except that what you taught us, indeed you and only you are all knowing and wise. He said, oh, Adam, inform them. So Adam teaches the angels of their names. And when he told them of names of those things, Allah said, did I not tell you that I know the secret of unseen in heavens and earth? And I know what you reveal, disclose, and what you reveal, disclose, and what you conceal and hide. Uh, and then when we order the angels, so this is after Adam teaches them the names, and these are the names of God or attributes of God in a sense. I, I think that's a better uh, way of putting it. I mean, of course, in Quran, it says the names of God. Um, so then the angels, uh, you know, basically bowed to, to Adam. So when we ordered to the angels, bow down, protesting, uh, prost prost prostrating yourselves before Adam, they all prostrated except Iblis the Shaitan. He refused and was arrogantly and proud. So he became the disbeliever. So the fact that they bowed happened after they were taught. And I think, uh, I don't know if I spoke about this before here or not, but what they were taught, uh, what we believe, uh, of course, generally people think that they, you know, people uh, think that the names of God that they were taught, that's what we know. So what we know is uh, God is Rahman or Rahim or Alem, you know, these are the names of God that we know, right? But uh, in reality, what Rumi is trying to tell us is that these, this, this is not what Adam taught to, to um, or Adam, this is not what Adam was taught, and that's not what he taught to the angels either. What Adam was taught was not only just the name, but the derivatives of the name. So what that means is that if we said that God knows everything or God is knowledgeable, the derivative of knowledge is, uh, you know, uh, science, uh, books, uh, teaching, um, wisdom, all of these things are the derivatives of that word knowledge. Or when you say God is, uh, you know, uh, 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 merciful. So merciful comes from kindness, you know, again, uh, you know, uh, 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 giving, uh, um, uh, everything that has to do with being merciful and all that. So there is a name and there are the derivatives of the name that actually kind of sum up to that name itself. So this is exactly what, what, what was taught to Adam. And that is what, you know, makes this whole um, event so glorified. And, and, and that's, what it, that's why it was so worthy to the angels so that they were, um, you know, of course, uh, bowing down to Adam because of what he knew. And, and remember, Adam was, again, through what we have read in the biblical um, books, um, or on specifically is that, you know, the moment that God, you know, um, uh, blow into us uh, of himself, of his own breath, that's when we actually came to, we came to life. So we became part of him, disconnected, yet connected in a sense that uh, every time that we realized him within us, that's exactly when we are connected to him. And every time that we forget him within us, that's when we're disconnecting from him. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Let's get back to um, these words again from Rumi. 
So, uh, but the good name of angels were wiped out by that blind one. So that's Satan, who God's own words would doubt. Satan, ascetic for millennia, then we muzzled and would not be freed again. So basically, this is how Satan t t was, in this case, he was muzzled in a sense, uh, you know, uh, 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 and the word that uh, Rumi is using here, I just want to make sure that I get this uh, word correct. Yeah. So basically what happened was that the muzzled is not the right word here. That's what I thought. So basically beforehand, uh, I, I think we all know this story that uh, Satan before becoming Satan, he was actually one of the, uh, you know, uh, high ranking angels in God's kingdom. And what happened was that because of him refusing to bow down, to Adam, he was then forced to, um, you know, forced to, uh, as an exile, or he was disconnected from, from, from God, in a sense. So in, in this case, Adam was what was brought forth. And he was, in, in this case, he was muzzled. So therefore, he went into the background. So Adam, with his ability to speak, and his ability to articulate and understand and his ability to connect to the almighty God, he came to the foreground and Satan went into the background. And in this case, uh, later on, we're going to realize that every time, of course, Rumi is talking about Satan, of course, he does have stories about him, but every time he talks about him, he's talking about um, our own ego our own bad self. Every time we allow our bad self to um, just, you know, show up and take control of events or words or things that we say, that's exactly when we are in, at the mercy of Satan. Okay. So, so he could not drink wisdom's milk at all, nor walk around God's heavenly castle hall. Physical senses are like muzzles too, that keep the milk of mystic truth from you. Now, he's now, uh, as soon as you know, he kind of distinguished for us what made Adam a connected soul and what made him great so that everyone else had to bow down to him and all that. Now he comes and tells us, because we are all descendant of Adam, he says, listen, your physical senses, and physical senses is, we have five of them, are like our muzzles. So the muzzle means that, you know, they, rather than they bring our heart and soul into the foreground, it takes our heart and soul into the background. So it's a muzzle to our heart and soul that keeps the milk of mystic truth from you. So we cannot enjoy that milk of mystic truth. A jewel has dropped into your, your heart's deep core. The jewel that he's talking about is the jewel of knowledge of God's names, which basically it's that, that is the knowledge that from the get-go, from the very beginning, Rumi believes what was given to us. I use this example and I'm going to use uh, in, 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 my uh, Tuesday uh, uh, class, and I'm going to use it here as well. I always say that, and I think we talked about this last time with you guys as well, um, Star Trek, I keep saying this, Star Trek, everything that I had seen when, uh, you know, in the 80s, when it was Star Trek, the next generation, and next generation was supposedly advanced version of original Star Trek. Everything that was in that Star Trek Next Generation, I'm not going to say everything because we still don't have commander data, although we may, 
but and I'm not a trekkie, but I just used to watch that a lot. Um, majority of it has been has been invented already. It has. So uh, we just are we're working. I'm sure they're working on you know the trans porting people back and forth and so forth. That's the different thing. But then everything else, when it comes down to communication, when it comes to tablets, when it comes down to wireless communication, all that stuff, it's all created. So just imagine the writer who is thinking this in 1980, where you hardly can have an imagination towards anything wireless. The only wireless devices that back then we had were radio transistors and remote controls. And they could only do certain functions, really. Not even remote control. I'm sorry? I said not even remote control, just the radio transistors. Right. I, 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 you're right. The remote controls were, were, were fairly... Because I remember we had a TV in Iran which had a very large remote. And the only thing you could do was to turn it on and off and it would change channels yeah. and that was it so the fact of the matter is that if if human uh, a human being has that level of imagination to see into the future and we have seen into the future and we have created them and we're still doing it and we're still creating and we're still being you know evolving into new horizons and new uh, ways of uh, creating life. That is not just by accident. I do believe that, yes, this, as, as Rumi says, there was a jewel of knowledge that was dropped into us. And that jewel of knowledge is something that people tap into and they can do what they do. And some people are completely disconnected from it. Because imagination is not anything that you can go to school and get a degree in imagination. You don't get a degree in imagination. You certainly get a degree in creation or engineering or craftsmanship, but imagination, you never get a degree for it. So, so why will worship, I'm sorry, so why still worship form an empty shape? Your soulless spirit must learn to escape. So now Rumi is saying that all this greatness is around us. All this greatness has, has been given to us. So why is it that you still worship form? And worshiping form means that we still are trying to make sense of things that have form and are, you know, tangible to our senses. Why is it that we still are bounding ourselves to what is tangible to our senses? After all of this, that we all admittedly agree to. And then remember, if you remember, we talked about a spirit and a soul right? We said we're given a spirit, and once the spirit is a connected spirit or a complete spirit, it, you know, uh, elevates or evolves into um, or, or, or just, you know, graduates into becoming a soul. And look how he's using that. He says, your soulless spirit must learn to escape. And what it needs to escape is it needs to escape from these five senses. If humans could be men, I'm sorry, if humans could be men through form and name, the prophet and Abu Jahl would be the same. So in this case, now he's trying to tell us that our form and name does not make us. He's like, if that was the case, Prophet Muhammad and Abu Jahl were both the same, but they were not. But if we were looking at just their forms and just their names, and by the way, Abu Jahl's name was not Abu Jahl all the time. Abu Jahl was actually Abu Hikmat before he denounced Prophet Muhammad. 
He was somebody that people would go to to get advice. But once he denounced Islam and de denounced uh, Prophet Muhammad, then they were given, he was given the name Abu Jah. So in this case, uh, what, what, what Rumi is saying is that, yeah, we, we've got to look beyond the form. Or basically don't judge the book by its cover. We have to learn to look beyond that and, and see the meanings behind, uh, uh, behind everything. Paintings can look like men, but still we doubt. When we look closely, something's been left out. Its form is perfect, but it lacks a soul. Go seek out that rare jewel that's your goal. So basically, Rumi is uh, comparing paintings um, kind of to us when we have not discovered our souls. So he's like, go find it because that is at, at the end, your virtue lies with that, with that finding and that, uh, and, 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 and finding that, uh, that, that connected soul, which actually just shows you and guides you to your greatness. The lions bowed their heads at what God gave the dog of companions of the cave. We heard about the story of the, um, the companions or the Ashab Kahf, who uh, there is a surah in Quran with their name and the fact that this dog was accompanying them. And that dog in, in, in form was a dog, but in spirit, he was a connected soul because he was a companion of connected people. And he's saying that lions who are supposedly king of the jungle, they bow down to him because he was able to allow himself to forget about his form and elevate his soul. Despite its ugly form, it reached the height of animal perfection through God's light. Dogs are not ugly, but, you know, Rumi is not too kind with dogs, I have to say. I have a problem with that, but again, you know, I'll let it go. The author's pen will not record your looks. Learned and just instead, they write in books. Such qualities are spiritual and real not things you can locate, observe, and feel. So now he's talking about the fact that everything is tangible. So unless you draw something, of course, even drawing can be mistaken for looks. It's like you cannot describe a look. If you're going to write, so let's say you were gonna describe my look. You would come back and say, he wears glasses. He has a set of eyebrows. You know, he's got a nose. He's got, you know, a set of lips, blah, blah, blah. That's just anyone. How would you say that how, what's the shape of my eye eyebrow or what's the shape of my nose? You cannot do that. You can't write it. So you have to, uh, so in this case, he, he's trying to tell us limitations of what we should know about our, our own life and our own senses. In this case, this is a sense of trying to write or describe something unless we look at something. And even if, when we look at stuff, we can't correctly put things together. We can approximate it if you have a sketch artist or something but it's never manifest to what it is. So such qualities are spiritual and, and real. Now he's talking about qualities uh, that we, um, in, in a sense, uh, um, how should I say it? Um, The, 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 when, when you're talking about somebody who is, uh, you know, learned or who is a scholar or somebody who is a just person, it is so, it's a meaning of, of, of what you have observed or what you have experienced. Justice to me makes, may, I'm going to say this, 
may look different or sound different than justice to another person. If I speak to somebody who is of, um, this is why we have such a pro tr trouble right now in our societies to talk about justice. If you talk to somebody who is African-American, for instance, to them, justice mainly lies on the fact that the treatment that they receive from law enforcement and things like that. And not all of them, of course, receive the same treatment, but they, in, in a percentage wise, they receive worse treatments in a statistical models and so forth than other races or than whites, let's just say. So it is what they perceive and what they are experiencing, which manifests itself in their opinion about justice. Now, I may not have received the same treatment that they technically receive. I may not have, but at the same time, I cannot put myself in their position because the color of my skin and the shape of my face and all that is different. So if they are different, then it's no, I cannot justify them. All I can do, and this is the problem that we're having in our society is this way, it is that it's interesting that people who are not able to fully experience that experience are trying to justify another experience for everyone else, which doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. But we do it just because we think that people expect it and it is what it is. Rumi says these qualities, you cannot, uh, you, you can't locate them or observe them. It's just stuff that, you know, it means something to that specific element or person. Okay. So he says, uh, next, he says, rays um, strike your frame from God's unknown domain, the Lord's divine, the Lord's divine son, heaven can't contain. So uh, the rays of uh, light from, from God's essence, you know, it, it, it comes to us and we have to just find it. And it's something that... Uh, it comes from the divine sun, uh, which nobody can contain it in a sense that it's so abundant and it's so big and it is so, uh, you know, generous that people cannot even fathom what that, what that is. Okay. Any questions about this section before we move to the next one, especially since I touched on Black Lives Matter. I swear, I, I fully believe this uh, personally. This is just my per personal uh, beliefs and, and, and views. Um, I, I, I fully believe uh, that um, if, uh, if Rumi is taught to this world, half of the problems will just get resolved. <laughs> I, I, I really believe that. Because what he says makes sense. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's so interesting that um, the appetite for this is, um, to a degree, it's been commercialized. And to another degree, it is just completely, it's not there. People are, I don't know, people, uh, I guess, you know, either they think they, they are fully, you know, uh, content with what they have, or I don't know what it is. It's just that this teaching is something that, you know, I think it can be liberating for people. I don't think it's only teaching, Mosin, because uh, there are a lot of great teachers existing right now, too. There are a lot of good literature, good, you know, ideology. The key is there are not takers. They were not takers even when Rumi was around. I think yeah. we are wired. Some of us are takers. Some of us, we are wired differently. Exactly like 
our political system. You know, there are extreme Republican who really think Trump is a prophet. Whatever he says is correct and everything else is wrong. And they're not pretending it is true beliefs. So I don't think it's teaching is the matter. It's just, yeah, I mean, more teaching, more clear things for the people. But, you know, someone bookman fahom lawyer, John, those people who are not, you know, believers, they are not going to even listen or understand what the reality is. Yeah. I think yeah. it's actually, it comes down to the application of it more than the teaching of it. Because there's so many people teaching all kinds of things like this, but not a lot of people are actually applying it in their life. And I think I would have to say I've seen so many people go through a lot of these programs like Tony Robbins and the, the, the like of it, and they come out still the same person, and they wonder why it didn't change them. Uh, but when you look at them, they don't apply any of the things they learn. So it's the same thing with every other class. It's not about the, necessarily the teaching, but about the application of it. And then the other most, and are you saying Trump is not God or something like that? <laughs> I didn't say that. I said some people like Rasul doesn't believe that. <laughs> 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 Mahdi. <laughs> um, uh, Mahdi is a great Mahdi is a great person. I, I've known him. I've had the pleasure of knowing him for a long time. And um, I can only say that what he just said, it's something that he, I know he actually um, does his best to apply it day in and day out. I can vouch for that i don't do that myself i have to say it but he does so that's awesome yeah Thanks good to know you, you maddie <clears throat> thank you um most and uh one one point uh when i think you you mentioned that the justice looks different to you than to me than to the other guys gals what what is ironic about it that i think most everywhere, but especially in this country, at the Supreme Court, the the Lady of the Justice has a blindfold on. And 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 you know what's funny? You're right. It does have a blindfold on. And uh, the the but what what amazes me is that, um, in true essence, I mean. So it's something that we have, we, we look at, right? It's something that to our eyes, it shows that, hey, this justice is something that is, is supposed to be blind by nature. Our problem is that when it comes down to application of it, in all levels, from the very top, I mean, look at, certain votes that happens look at certain uh, i mean if, if we want to look at the justice system here and, and supreme court um look at how these these votes sometimes most of the time they are partisan and then come down through the courts and and look at i mean certain issues i'm not talking about a dispute between a business and another business i'm talking about civil liberties or rights of people and all that. There are certain areas where as these things are extremely, um, you know, diluted with um, non-facts and extreme opinions. Whereas, as you said, if justice was truly blind, it would not be looking at that. And it would be looking at it as, uh, so, Anyways, it's um, at the moment it is what it is. We 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 will, uh, you know, we will see better days. But we have to go through darkness, and I'm just saying this through uh, teachings of Rumi again. Unless we go through darkness, we will not see light. You have to experience it. You have to see it. 
you have to see, you know, you have to go through the bad until you realize the good, because we are in a world that is, uh, you know, totally um, uh, constructed upon uh, the opposites. We've talked about this already. So, okay, let's go to the next section. So an account of uh, the hair's knowledge and an explanation of the virtue and benefits of knowledge. So it says uh, this discourse has no end. Let's leave it here, leave it, leave it there and listen to the story of the hare. Sell those dumb ears and buy some better ones for donkey's ears are just for simpletons. Now in, in Farsi language, if you call somebody a donkey, that means that they are stupid. So I have to say that so that you understand why the use, the word used, the word donkey was used in the, in the poetry, the original one, and why he's actually translating it as such. So basically saying that, you know, if you have a dumb ear, that means that, you know, you have donkey's ear and therefore, you know, you got to get rid of them and get, you know, uh, uh, you got to get something better. So witness the hare, outfox the lion with tricks. Come learn about the plot he tried to fix. So let's see what he did with the lion. In Solomon's realm, knowledge was a goal, was the goal. This world's material, knowledge for the soul. Now, um, now he's talking about knowledge. And remember, he defined knowledge for us in the previous section as knowledge is something that is originally given to Adam. So that means that it's been originally given to all of us. So knowledge, we all have it. What Rumi believes we should do is we should uncover what we have within us. That's why he says this is a jewel within you. By trade and by nature, jewels are always hidden. If you want to find a diamond, you have to dig. If you want to find gold, you have to dig. So you dig for them. And that, uh, what he's trying to tell us is that there is a jewel within us that you've got to dig for it. So it says, um, yeah, uh, knowledge is what makes man magnificent. While other creatures are all impotent. So he says that that knowledge that was given to us, again, knowledge that was given to us from the get-go, from the beginning, from our creation, is what makes us magnificent and unique, while other creatures are all impotent because they, don't, they, they just don't have that. Lions and leopards turn to mice through fear, and crocodiles turn pale when he comes near. Uh, so in this case, he's talking about, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I think I, I, I missed the line. So in Solomon's realm, I, I read this one, right? In Solomon's realm, knowledge was the goal. This world's material knowledge for the soul. Knowledge is what makes man magnificent. Okay, we, we read that one. Okay, lions and leopards turn to mice through fear. So this is fear of something. So this is the part that, you know, the translation is also a little uh, mistaken. So fear of knowledge. So in this case, fear of not having it is what turns lions and leopards into mice. And croc crocodile will, will turn pale when he comes near. What, who comes near? The person with knowledge, the person who has that divine knowledge within him. Angels and demons run out to the shores. I'll seek a hiding place or bolt their doors when somebody with knowledge shows up or comes around. So men have... So man, so man has very many hidden foes. A cautious man is the one with sense who knows. So now he's talking about, now that I have told you that when a knowledgeable person 
is this powerful that all these, you know, um, creatures that I mentioned kind of run away and try to hide from him. A man who is not knowledgeable is very susceptible to attacks from all these people. That's why he's saying that so a man has many hidden foes. Now, hidden foes in here, that doesn't mean that there is a lion around the corner. And if I am somebody with knowledge, he's going to go away. And, you know, if uh, I don't have knowledge, he's going to come and attack me. The lions, I mean, the names that he's using, it's basically people. And the reason he's using these names for people is because he believes that the, the spirits of people originally are either a spirits of the plants or the spirits of the animals. So Rumi has a poetry um, and uh, if somebody would remind me next time, I'll bring the translation of it, which he says, uh, the literal translation of it is that last night I was looking around town with a light and I was looking to find a human. And somebody told me that um, we've been looking for humans and we can't find them. And he says that I even uh, when one at once I heard that story, that answer, I said, the one, the thing that you couldn't find it, I still I'm going to search for it and I'll eventually find it. So why does he say that? Because what he believes is that unless we elevate our soul from that level of plants and animals to a level of human, we're still going to be an animal. So that means that in here, this is why he says angels and demons run out of the sh to the shores. So basically, if we are, if I am a person without knowledge or without wisdom or without that knowledge within me, then I'm susceptible to their attack or to the attacks of lions and leopards. So <clears throat> all kinds of creatures hidden from our sight, attempt to strike your heart with all their might. Now, this basically, now he basically, uh, you know, reaffirms what we just talked about, that, you know, all kinds of creatures, they are not, they're hidden from our sight. What he's trying to say is that you see people, but you don't see their soul. Somebody who looks like a man has a suit on and, you know, looks and talks like other human beings. But the spirit within him is not a human spirit. It's an animal. So all kinds of creatures hidden from our sight attempt to strike your heart. That person is not going to strike you personally. He would not ever punch you. He's going to strike your heart with all their might. If you should ever wash down by the stream, a thorn inside is bound to make you scream. So it's like, if you ever wanted to wash yourself sometimes, you know, by a stream of a river, there is a chance that the thorn inside the river might go into your foot and it would make you scream, okay? Although it's hidden down below, beware, once you're pricked, you'll know for sure it's there. So it's like, sometimes we say that, oh, well, it's not there. It's like, you have to understand that this riverbed is full of these thorns and it will hit you. So you better be careful about this. Some thorns inspire, some tempt you from your course. They come from thousands, not a single source. So this is another uh, important line here. So it's like these thorns sometimes can move you towards a positive path or sometimes they can totally prevent you from moving forward. Some of them inspire and some tempt from your course. They come from thousands, not a single source. In this case, the source is talking about 
all these different praise that are around, which we don't see them. Wait till your outward senses have evolved. So it's like the only time that you will start seeing them is when you start evolving your outward senses. Wait until your outward senses have evolved to see them all and find your problem solved. You'll see then just whom you have failed to heed and whom you've judged as qualified to lead. So it's like there is a time that eventually your senses, you, you will master them. And then at that time, you're going to start realizing that who did you listen to that you should not have listened to? And who did you ignore that you should not have ignored? And in this case, this is what we just talked about it in the little uh, discussion that we had before this section that yeah, people sometimes are not ready to listen to these stuff. Although you tell them that, hey, you know, it's, uh, it's something that's gonna help out with your salvation. So um, next section, he talks about other animals seek from the hair, the secret of his thoughts. So basically this rabbit is like, I'm going to take this guy down. And they're like, how? So the other beasts then said, quick thinking hair, what is it you perceive of your affair? You've dealt with king size problems. So relate what you conclude about our present state. Conferral aids perception, helps one learn, like minds can help their fellows to discern. The prophet said, consult them, counselor, consult them, counselor, and trust the ones with whom you must confer. So Basically, they start asking a question that, you know, okay, so what is it that you have planned? What are you planning on doing and how are you planning on executing it? And then he's like giving us just a, uh, the fact that, you know, it's always good to confer and talk, uh, you know, uh, with, with others, with other like minds, in a sense, people who actually think like you. So it's like, if, if you, the, the person that you are conferring to and you are consulting with, you have to make sure that they are like-minded people because, uh, and that, that, that kind of puts a little bit of a weight as far as the fact that who do we tell our problems to and who do we, who do we trust? And that means that we need to be able to perhaps use a little bit of a, um, some sort of a tool to actually get to know the souls of these individuals. So are they actually of the like-minded souls just like us or not? So the prophet said, consult them, counselor. So it's like, go ahead and talk to them. If you find people who are like-minded and trust the ones with whom you must confer and just basically trust them. So the hair withheld what secret that that secret from them so in this case rumi is trying to say that the rabbit didn't see them as uh, you know people who were um uh trustworthy to actually know what his plans were so therefore he did he didn't say anything so the hare said every secret can't be shown dice bring up odds then evens when they're thrown so he's like He's using an example of uh, backgammon in a sense that in, in the game of backgammon, as you throw the dice, either you get odds or evens. And depending on what you get, you have to make your choices as far as how you, um, how you actually want to play. Remember, we talked about this, that Rumi uses the game of backgammon as something that actually is choice versus destiny. We have a destiny when we actually throw the dice. Whatever we get, we have choices as far as how we want to work with it. So he's like, yeah, I, I, I rather, you know, keep the odds to myself. To clean a mirror first, you want to blow. 
but steam will quickly dull the mirror's glow. So it's like uh, if if you want to you know clean a mirror, the first thing is once you actually blow into it, although it's a mirror and it's supposed to show a reflection, but once you kind of cover it with your um, with your breath uh, or the steam of your breath, it would not show anything. So I rather keep a tight lip here. Keep your lips sealed. Don't mention as a rule your path, your wealth, and your religious school. So he kind yeah, of goes. There it is. Little... Those are the three. I'm sorry. I said those are the three. Uh, that's a uh, word to the wise, even today. Yeah. Yeah, so he says that basically, you know, try to not say anything regarding these three, your path or where you've been, your wealth and your religious beliefs. For those three can attract so many foes, each one will wait to catch you once he knows. So in this case, remember, in the past story, he's telling us that not everyone that you encounter has got a connected soul or a soul like yours. They are, you know, they are just created as, you know, perhaps with an animal soul or a prey who actually is, I'm sorry, a, 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 um, a, an animal who is actually trying to, you know, ambush you and, and take you away or, or tear you apart. So be careful about that. And that's when you need to start, you know, kind of sharpening your saw as to realizing who you can trust and talk, talk to rather than who you can't. So don't even tell a few you have not read. Um, don't even tell a few, have you not read all secrets shared by more than two are spread? So basically, this is also another thing that once something is, you know, shared more than, you know, with more than one person, then that's not a secret anymore. Because that person also has a friend who they're going to go to and that friend, they're going to tell them, oh, I'm going to tell you something, but you have to promise me you're not going to tell anyone. And he's going to go to that other person or she's going to go and say, oh, I got something. You should promise me not to tell you anyone. It, it's just going to. Yeah. So tie up two birds together and you'll see that they stay grounded, trapped in agony. They are actually conferring, though they're bound with metaphors to fool all those around. The prophet gave exclusive teachings to answering the, the, his men through, though they then had no clue to clock his words he'd use a parable so foes could not grasp what was valuable. So basically he's trying to say that even the prophet did not divulge everything that was basically given to him by, by God. As a matter of fact, this is another thing about the beauty of the words of the Quran because not everyone is meant to understand the Quran. Not everyone understands it, believe it or not. And, and another thing that we know has happened is that some people even misunderstood the Quran and have uh, perhaps done massacres or they have wrongly killed because of their misunderstanding of the Quran. And that's just because, you know, this was not meant for everyone to fully understand. And the Prophet you know, also knew this, and uh, but he wanted those mysteries, the mystical mysteries within the Quran, to be uh, hidden from everyone else. Mosin, yes, uh, I like to say that the Quran is meant for everybody to understand at their own level, not that not everybody is meant to understand Quran. Um, okay, I sure. I, I uh, again, I, I respect that. Yeah. My uh, opinion about it is, uh, unfortunately, these days I, f um, I sometimes argue about um, this matter with with certain 
acquaintances that, you know, they used to be friends, but they're not friends anymore. They're acquaintances. Um, recently, I saw a post that somebody had just put on, you know, um, Facebook and the post said that in the Quran, there is one page that God just talks about himself. And the next page, he keeps on threatening us that if we don't do what he says, he's going to, what he's going to do to us. And I think, you know, rather than interpreting Quran is for who, why don't we go back to what Quran said in the first, you know, after Alham, Zalik al Kitabu, La Raiba Fihe Hodan Lel Muttaqin. It's not for everybody. The book is a guidance for the people who are Muttaqi and then explain who Muttaqis are. So it's very, very, very clear who can. Benefit out of Quran, right. not for but, but 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 see, yeah. Let me so just to finish my uh, uh, my my sentence on that. Um, when I when I read that post, I told people that uh, I wrote underneath it that whoever has written this clearly has never opened up the Quran and yeah. doesn't know. But as you start talking, you know, people have read it. And they read it and they read it very objectively and they can take the objectives that they want out of it. So for instance, one of them came back and, and I love this thing that uh, uh, these days we have this uh, uh, softwares that we can just search. Yeah. Like in the Quran, you know, the, the, it's always talking about, uh, you know, um, killing. You know, the word otela. I'm like, do you know how many times it's been, it's been, uh, you know, recited in the Quran? And there's like, I don't know, probably a thousand times. I'm like, <laughs> it only got 6,000 verses, dude, come on. So you can't say a thousand, but give me a, give me a percentage and so forth. So we started looking at it and it's interesting. 147 times the word otela is in the Quran, but majority of it, is the story of Pharaoh and Moses. It's so funny. It is that story that has the majority of those words in it. Of course, you know, there is a story of how the struggle of the uh, of Moses and uh, you know Ome, you know, the, the the his followers with Pharaoh and so forth. And but it's it's an interesting thing that you know. Even nowadays, people refuse to go back and even objectively, truly looking at a look at this. So we are we are just we dictate to ourselves what we want to dictate to ourselves, and this is what Rumi is trying to tell us. If we don't open up our eyes, and if we don't want to open up our hearts and our you know, our, our, you know, insight into this life, we're going to live it, you know, what we want to live with and, and what we want to believe in, which is most of the time is not the truth. And that is sad. So, so now he goes into, uh, of course, now we're going to talk about the plot, the plot that the rabbit has got for the lion. So the story of the hare's plot. The hare delayed his journey for a while, then started to complete that final mile. So he deliberately delays going to the lion. That lion slew foes and the hare's was late. So... The line, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, that, that line slew foes and the hare was late, so he would beat the ground and roar irate. I knew those wretched beasts were bound to break their promises, their contract was a fake. They have tripped me, they have tripped me up so crudely with decide how many times will fate's tricks thus repeat i'm sorry deceit uh how many times uh, how many times will fate's tricks thus repeat 
All feeble-minded princes feel despair when they can't see what's happening out there. So uh, now he's basically pretty upset about what has happened. Originally, he said that I should never believe these people. And now he's kind of telling himself that I did believe them. And because I believe them, this is what happened. Now, then uh, he, he goes into um, uh, the, uh, the say that, you know, what, what they told me was some sort of a trick that my ego played on me. My ego told me that, yeah, you know what? You don't have to really worry about this anymore. They're going to do this. And it's like, that's what, what happened to me. They, I, I was tricked by my ego. And uh, then because of this, uh, um, I, I, I just said that I would not come and hunt. And how many times have I been, have I been tricked by my ego in this lifetime? So... Then he goes, uh, the, road, the road looks smooth, but traps are set below. When they lack meaning, names are just for show. So it's like uh, in life, the path kind of seems slow, smooth for everyone. But as you set foot in this path, you know, there are traps. And uh, there is uh, the problem also is that the uh, names, names here is referring to um, the names that were, were taught. Uh, if you don't understand the meaning behind these names, then you fall into traps one after another. And in this case, he's kind of neglecting the, or, or he's kind of blaming himself for not fully understanding the meaning behind uh, trust. Both words and names are hidden pitfalls too. Flattery is sand, which saps all life from you. And uh, he's using sand's analogy in a sense that uh, what Rumi believes is that if you have uh, a jar full of sand and if you pour water in it, sand will just take the water and absorb it and would not allow you to, to enjoy that water. So in this case... He's saying that these names, uh, which we don't understand them, these words and names are our pitfalls. And we will, uh, unless we understand what they mean and what is the energy or the meaning behind them, you know, this could actually bring us, um, bring us problems. This word, these, these words also is referring to the fact that every word that we speak has energy behind it. We are, uh, we are affected by these energies and as they come to us. The sand which gushes, water is so rare. So most of the time the sand is absorbing water. It doesn't gush it. So you'll have to search for that kind everywhere. So the, part, the, the sand that gushes uh, is like uh, the only time that water comes out of um, the earth is if you actually find a stream that is bubbling up. And in this case, Rumi is trying to tell us that in order for us to fully be self-sufficient and fully be free of everything else. We have to start gushing water from within ourselves rather than having it to be poured on us. The man of God is like that type of sand. Fleeing himself, he grabs God's helping hand. So basically the only people who actually are using this are men of God, men who have realized God within themselves. Faith water flow from him relentlessly, reviving seekers with love's gift for free. So basically, that's how men of God also not only, you know, take their own, take care of their own thirst, but also the thirst of others. But other men are like the 
dry as sand. They sap all life from you. Please understand. And also, he's also trying to tell us that there are other companions that we may have, which they just suck the life out of us. And I'm sure that you guys don't have any friends like that. Or if I you call do, those people anaconda. <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously, there are times that, you know, we, uh, we encounter these people that, you know, rather than giving life to us, they just basically suck the life out of us. Seek wisdom from the sage now, if you can. Gain now knowledge and new vision from this man. So that this man, he's referring to the man who actually has a stream that's gushing from within himself. Seek wisdom and then you'll become its source. So he's like, you need to start learning. And this is exactly what you guys are doing. You guys are seeking wisdom and you're trying to learn that within yourself. Seek wisdom and then you'll become its source. Needless, safe from what derives men from their course the student's table turns to one preserved when intellect from spirit grace is served now he's now talking about uh, um, it's not necessarily the student's tablet he's talking about uh, mahfuz. so uh, the um, the expression of lohe mahfuz is what has been referred to as uh, uh, the Quran. The fact that it's something that has been preserved and it preserves not only itself, but also the meanings within it. So it is talking about that when intellect from spirit grace is served. So basically the only way to understand this is that your spirit needs to be worthy of understanding the meaning in the this you know preserved tablet or lohe mahfuz. Okay, and of course, Motunaga, uh, you know the lohe mahfuz is kitab mubin, not Quran. But here you may sure there is a difference between lohe mahfuz and Quran. Lohe mahfuz is the book that God said every single act is written, even there's not any leaves of tree that is falling and it's not written in that book. Mm -hmm. And it's not, of course, it's God is the only one who has that knowledge. Well, in this case, thank you for, for that explanation. In this case, Rumi is talking about uh, a, um, you know, the, um, this preserved, um, tablet is something that's within us as well and it's been preserved because it's been given to us from the uh, from the moment of the creation and once it's been given to us it's up to us to actually tap into it and connect with it or else you know um, it's not there but yeah your explanation also is valid at first, his intellect would lead the way, but like a student, now it must obey. So in our, in our world, when we start learning, we start learning with our mind and intellect. And, but at some point, he's saying that you've got to kind of start letting go and you have to start obeying. And in this case, we have to obey whoever is uh, you know, greater than us. The intellect repeats what gospel said, prophet, I'll be, I'll burn if I should move ahead. Now is uh, in this line, he's referring to the journey of the prophet to, um, um, to this ninth heaven um, at Me'raj, basically, when and the prophet actually was able to, you know, leave the earth and go up uh, to the heavens and the story goes in this form that uh, when prophet got to the seventh heaven Gabriel or Gabriel who was with him told him that I cannot move any further and the prophet said why he says that if I actually move an inch my whole uh, everything that I have all my feathers will be burned so um 
Now, Rumi is using this line to tell us the greatness of this preserved wisdom or the preserved tablet that's within us. And the greatness comes from the fact that a part of God is within us by him, you know, perhaps, you know, giving his own, giving our soul from his own breath. Because that enables us to actually get to the greatest level of the heavens. And this is symbolic, of course, but again, you know, we're talking about becoming one with the Almighty. So he says, um, yeah, Prophet, uh, I'll burn if I should move ahead. And that's the, what Gabriel said. But you can still proceed towards the goal. I've reached my limit, Sultan of Soul. So Sultan of Soul is what, you know, Gabriel referred to Prophet Muhammad. Uh, in that trip or in that journey that they had. Now, again, Rumi is using this in order to tell us how great our soul can be. Each heedless and impatient low ingrate complains that he must always follow fate. Now, he's saying that... Uh, Either people are willing to realize their greatness or they come back and they, because they are so impatient with what life throws at them, they come back and they complain and they just say, hey, you know what? It's our fate. I got nothing else to do and I got nothing else to work for. Excuses like from, excuses like, like from those who feign being ill, they'll suffer from a sickness that can kill. So it's like uh, when somebody keeps telling himself that I'm sick, eventually that sickness is going to emerge and eventually it's going to kill. Him. We know this now through science, but that's what he said back then that, you know, you could you have a choice. You could actually live your life as a healthy person, or you could come back and completely just, you know, say that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sick. I'm ill. I'm, I'm nothing. I have no control. I have no, um, uh, you know, I cannot do anything about this life. I cannot change anything here and all that. And eventually you kill yourself from it. Saying you're sick in, in jest, the prophet said, will bring an illness that will leave you dead. This is also a saying from the prophet that, hey, you keep talking about you're sick, you will die eventually. Faith ties up broken bones to heal the pain and joins together every broken vein. Now, he's saying that um, what is fate? He's, the, the question is actually here in the, in, this is a, again, a bad translation here. So it says, what is fate? Fate ties up broken bones. So what he's saying is that when you're, when you have a broken bone, so, so, so think through the example that he's given us. A broken bone is something that, you know, we were doing something, you were trying to do something and you fell and you broke your bone. Now you have to sit back and allow that broken bone to heal. That is fate, in Rumi's opinion. Fate ties up broken bones to heal the pain and joins together, together every broken vein. Or if you are trying to do something and you cut yourself accidentally and so forth, that is when you sit back, you rest, and you allow fate to do what it's supposed to do. This is a very, very important uh, view into this thing. So I, I just want to make sure that we are all, we get it. You see what, what he's doing? He's telling us that, you know, yeah, fate is there. But you have to do your job. 
if while you're trying to do your job or while you're searching or while you're doing everything that you can, you break your leg, that's fine. You now sit back and allow fate to do its work. But before that, you have to keep on working. So he says, you haven't broken any bone. You haven't broken any bones. That's a bad uh, translation. So you haven't broken any bones, you know. So who are you fooling with your bandaged toe? So it's like, if you haven't broken anything, why are you bandaging yourself? Why are you limiting yourself? One suffered so much striving on his co- on this course, and so um, and so Borag was sent down as his horse. So Borag is actually not a name; it's actually a word that means horse. So he's the, the translation also is is a little funny here. So it says that. If you suffer in this, you know, while you're trying to get to your destination, that is when a a horse or a something that you can ride on will be sent to you. He was now born for faith demands he'd faced. He followed orders first, then was embraced. Listen, before you go uh, too far, yeah. isn't that Barak a reference to the horse that essentially Prophet Muhammad used to ascend? Barak was, yeah, it's, it's, but it's, it's also, in, you're right, it's the, the, yeah, the, the, the horse, yeah, I guess it was a, it was looking like a horse that, you know, he took him to the heavens, yeah. But it also means that, it literally, that means that, um, um, he, he uses this word a lot in, in exchange with something that you actually ride on. So, yeah. Um, then, uh, all right, so where are we with this? So now, now he says, uh, somebody who was, um, he was now born for faith demands he'd faced. He followed orders first then was embraced. So it's like through this journey, as he actually strives to actually achieve more and more greatness within himself, at the beginning, he was somebody who, um, uh, he he had to obey or uh, do what his faith demands that you know he, he needed to basically just not only follow but also teach it and all that he followed orders first now he was embraced and and once he followed orders from from god now he was being embraced by god and again he's referring to prophet muhammad um before he'd have to meet the king's demands but now the army follows his command. Same, same meaning as, as, as above. Stars are used to influence him then, but now he rules the stars like this is his men. So he's now, now referring to um, the uh, position or uh, the, um, the astrology beliefs that people have and so forth. That, you know, astrology, Rumi fully believes in it. He does believe that astrology does, you know, exert certain energies upon us and all that. But he also believes that people who are connected souls are not necessarily being commanded by the stars. They are actually people who do command these stars. So, but now he rules the stars just like his men. If you have problems in perceiving it, you also, you'll also doubt the fact the moon was split. Splitting the moon, as you all know, Shaqol Qamar is also something that was, uh, you know, uh, a, a miracle performed by uh, the Prophet Muhammad. And he's like, if you can't understand this, you probably won't believe that one either. And he's like, that's your mind basically blocking you to start understanding what is possible beyond the five senses that we have and the heart 
and, and the ego and the mind that you know tries to control us. Revive your faith, but not just with your tongue. Secretly to your lusts, why have you clung? It's like, try to revive your faith. And in this case, reviving your faith means the fact that try to fully understand what you are about, what you're made of, and what you can do. Try not to do this, you know, uh, you know, just don't be a people pleaser in a sense. So, you know, secretly to your lust, why have you clung? When lusts are fresh, faith can't be anymore. Lust is the very key that locks the door. So it's like, in this case, lust is that desires that we have because of our earthly body and our ego. So it says that when lusts are fresh, faith can't be anymore. So when you keep on working with these lusts, the faith can't do what it's supposed to do, or you cannot revive the faith within yourself, or you cannot elevate your soul from the animal level to the human level. It's just a preventative force. Now you're judging God's inviolate in the words. Examine your own soul, not truth you've heard. So it's like, Try not to judge what God has said. And that's exactly what we do sometimes. And people do that these days. We have people who, because they don't know what the true meaning of the words of God are, they perceive something differently. And then in return, I mean, following that, they would also judge God. We judge God. That's amazing that he's been saying that. And we see that here. We judge him. We judge his, uh, uh, his justice. We judge his, 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 uh, his forgiveness. We judge everything about him sometimes. And that's because, you know, uh, we are blind into what's happening to us. So now you're judging God's inviolate words Examine your own soul, not truth you've heard. Since you read through desire, the holy verse, you make its meaning wretched and perverse. So, so in this case, he's saying that uh, you, the only way that you are interpreting the verses of Quran in this case, or the verses of the divine book in a sense, um, is you interpret them through your own desires. And that is a wrong interpretation. And because of that, you just mislead yourself and everything else. All right. I think we're out of time. I wanted to get to this story, but probably we should read it next time. It's about a fly who actually feels that, you know, he's um, an admiral or a captain of a ship. And it's a pretty funny story and pretty interesting analogy that um, I'll just read the first thing. So a fly in donkey's urine perched on straw, just like a boatman gazing at the shore. So he's sitting on some feces or some donkey's urine, and he's saying that I am a captain of my ship. That's... You know, again, he uses these examples to tell us sometimes what we look at. I mean, we look at world, uh, worlds through these types of goggles and visions. But we're going to read this next time and we'll, we'll so definitely. This stage, why why uh, Fly thinks that he's the captain? Because the, the uh, straw is essentially floating on the uh, urine. And the fly is sitting on the uh, straw, and that's why he thinks he's the captain. I know. So again, again, you know, um, he thinks. Uh, uh, Do you know that? I mean, the Farsi right? word, the Farsi sentences are so funny. It's yeah. just like you know, because it's just he's saying that. Yeah, I'm it. I got it all. I, I'm. 
conquering the world. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, all right. Any questions? Any, anything that we've missed or any questions or any? Uh, no. Anna is asking if the lion story is over. I think no. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a few more weeks. This is Rumi. Yeah, you see a lot of other stuff because it goes back to that. A lot of, yeah. tangent, a lot of tangential things before we get back. Yeah. So Rumi does this. He says this story, then he says something in between, then he says another one, then he goes back to it, and then and then eventually well, he finishes. He, he's, yeah. It's kind of finish him. That's uh, why it's so story, complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, it's a little... He does that a lot, so gear up. I mean, I've never seen him tell a story straight up. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've never encountered one. So now you know how lost I am when I say the lion is over. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that's everybody. So yeah, no. so we're still yeah we're still trying to figure out. But, but the only thing is, I just gotta have to tell you, right up till up, up until now, the lion had the character of somebody who was willing to work for what he was earning, and he believed in choice, and he believed in you know going out there and trying. To, to live a prosperous you know, life and so forth. From this point on, the character of the lion is gonna change. And again, Lu Rumi allows himself to do that. He just does it, just because it's him. I mean, I could never reach him to tell him that this is, you know, you, <laughs> this is- <Confusing>. <laughs> you know, But again, you know, he does it. He just changes the character because he feels now he has a different purpose for the story. He uses so, the golden rule. What's the golden rule? The man with the gold rules. What is it? I don't. I didn't know that. So, so he he's in control. He decides what oh, to yeah. do. Oh yeah, for sure. He's in control. That's that's for sure in this yeah. case. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank, you thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. See you next week. Yeah. Have a good, good night, night, guys.